Hello, everybody. Andrew Fantasia here. Welcome to Digital Charcuterie. And today is a very special day. It's going to be a little quicker video than normal here. I just did a giant big crossover video with the Meeple Monkey. It's the second one we've done here on Digital Charcuterie. The Meeple Monkey is an awesome guy uh, who talks about lots of board games, but primarily lots of Marvel United. And he does a lot of homebrew stuff. And he's one of the homebrew champs, as far as I'm concerned. And he showed us the ropes. I gave him some characters, and he walked through how to make it. It's great stuff. So check that out on the channel right now if you haven't already. And like and subscribe and click bells and all that stuff. But we are here to talk about Spider-Man, particularly about Spider-Geddon, because that Spider-Geddon box that they announced way back in January, we've heard zilch since then. It is now six months later, and we are finally getting more than zilch. Hashtag more than zilch. We finally know more about this box uh, including what the minis are like and what the cards are like. And we're going to walk through that together, just give a quick little glimpse, and I'll just give my thoughts, and you can give me yours in the comments and all that stuff. So I am going to share my screen here. There we go. And get this out right here. Awesome. Okay. So I just want to go through this Spider Geddon update here and talk about uh, one of the things that we can, uh, well, some of the things that we can expect to see in Spider-Geddon. So obviously there's all this stuff about the tokens and all that and, and the question that everybody was dying to have answered and they didn't quite know, which is when can I get my hands on this? And they say, unfortunately, that's not accurate because uh, there was an Amazon listing that went out saying August 1st and that's what they're saying. That's not accurate, not August 1st. There've been some production delays. The first taste of this box will be offered at Gen Con, which starts August 3rd. Attendees will be able to demo Spider-Geddon. Very limited quantity will be available for sale after that. English retail release, which is US, Canada, UK, and Australia, should happen in October. And there are also localized versions in the works, should be released a few months afterwards all over the world. So if you're from US, Canada, UK, or Australia, October sounds about right. Um, Meeple Monkey mentioned Australians might be getting it September 30th, which is even better than October. So that's good news. But it's only a couple of months away. At least we don't have anything concrete, but we're in the right ballpark. And here's the box that we saw way back when. It still has not changed. It's beautiful. It's Spider-Geddon. Everybody's there. I love it so much. And then we go down and we kind of see what's all in there. And then they give us the juicy goods, which is what all these characters look like and what they can do. So Symbiote Spider-Man is not an anti-hero. I thought he was going to be. He's a hero. That's fine. Whatever. Whatever. I'm not, I'm not upset. Uh, but this is uh, this is what he looks like, and this is what his cards look like. They are black and white because I think we kind of all assume they would be. Uh, I love looking at the color of the cards and you know how they match them up with the colors of the heroes. This game is so colorful. You've heard me talk about it before. It's one of the many reasons why I love it. It's just a beautiful game to look at. Um, so those are some of the cards there. They say the black suit may look cool, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, and they talk about the great power and great responsibility cards and how they grant him a wild token for rescuing civilians and attack tokens for defeating thugs instead of heroic tokens, because they're really embracing the fact that the symbiote suit Spider-Man is more aggressive. And nowhere is that more apparent than in this card right here, Symbiote Enhancement. This is my favorite, I think, of all the new cards they've uh, showcased from this box, because it's so thematic. You may punch twice. If you do, on your next turn, you must play your card randomly. Like, come on, right? Thematic as F. That is totally Peter in that symbiote suit where he's getting all aggro. I'm just, remember, my brain goes to the 90s cartoon. So I'm going to be dropping 90s cartoon references all the time here. But I just think of um, him wailing on the shocker. Like, Get back here, shocker! And him losing control, which is exactly what happens here. He loses control and he has to play a card randomly. So his aggression ends up hurting himself and the team. And that is so succinctly sums up Symbiote Spider-Man and say that 10 times fast that I couldn't have asked for a better card. And the mini is pretty gorgeous too. So there you go. I'm, uh, I'm very happy with how this turned out. Um, and now we're gonna scroll down to the one that I was the most excited for, the Scarlet Spider. Um, and this, I mean, first of all, that, is a beautiful looking image, like they nailed him in the image. Uh, and then the cards, the cards are that bright red and the bright um, 
I want to say teal, the teal color of his hoodie. Uh, and uh, they nailed it with these cards. Um, it's it's almost, I, I think it's flawless in, as, to, as far as the colors are concerned. So he's got Spider Sense, which works a little bit differently, where he gains a wild token. And as long as the card's faced up in the storyline, he may discard any number of wild tokens to ignore the same amount of damage. So he's able to use his Spider Sense to evade the villain attacks. And then he's also got Great Power and Great Responsibility cards, which gain him tokens. Scarlet Spider looks like a lot of fun. And he comes with web shooters, which let him move, or he can web a civilian or a thug from an adjacent location to his. I like it. I will say his is my least favorite mini. Uh, and I don't think it's a bad mini. Like I, I can make zero minis. Cool mini or not can make infinity minis. Do the math. Guess who's better at making minis? Not me. So this is just, I mean, the other minis are just cooler. That's literally it. There's nothing inherently wrong with this one. It's just, it doesn't stand out as much as the others, as much as these beautiful cards and this beautiful image but still a great mini. And then we got Silk jumping over this tombstone and the miniature is doing the same thing. Silk's cards look great, black, white, and red. Perfect, the coloring is awesome. So she has something called Silk Sense, which allows her, as it says here, not only to stay out of the way of the villain, but also to ignore damage that she would receive. So as long as this card is face up in the storyline, once per villain turn, if a villain ends their movement in your location, you may immediately move to an adjacent one. If you do ignore the first damage, you would take that turn. So it's kind of like Phantom X, right? Because Phantom X can move as soon as he sees the villain card, but she can also spend the whole turn negating damage. So she's really wily and slippery, which you know you can tell just by looking at her. She's hopping over a tombstone. That is not a lady who's going to let herself get hit by a bullet. Uh, and then she's got organic webbing and claws. Silk just looks, she looks badass. I'm excited. And what a mini, man. That is like... It might be my favorite mini, the best mini of the box. Just her jumping over a tombstone, like, damn. Um, but we'll see. It's too early to call. It's too early to call. Even though I've seen these before, it's too early to call what my favorite mini is because Spider-Man Noir is next, folks. And talk about a cool miniature. But uh, first, look at those cards, right? Great. Black, white, and gray. It, it fits the theme of him. Um, I love this card, Black Suit. And um, I will read it in Nicolas Cage's voice for you. Apologies or you're welcome, depending on how you feel about that. Black suit, as long as this card is face up in the storyline, if you're alone in your location, you may ignore one damage dealt by a threat in each villain turn. Wow. Okay. So that, again, very thematic because Spider-Man Noir is a loner, right? Uh, so as long as he's alone... He could ignore the damage dealt by a threat. Uh, it, it makes sense to me. It fits thematically. And then you got these other ones. If there's too much power, it's the responsibility of the people to take it back. Uh, so he can attach target tokens to villains or, and maybe henchmen. It's hard to tell. Um, I think it's just villains, according to what it says here. Uh, and then that kind of puts a target on their back and helps other characters attack them. Um, and I love this line, ever the brooding loner, Spider-Man Noir can ignore damage. Don't play a threat card if he's alone in his location. And you have this beautiful mini of him with his grappling gun hanging onto a brick wall. Um, the brick wall minis are hit or miss. Uh, you know, the Shadow Cat one and the Spider-Man one, I know a lot of people weren't crazy about them. I think they're fine, but this is my favorite of the brick wall ones because look at it. That's perfect. That's Spider-Man Noir. Next is Penny Parker. Now, I was really curious about Penny Parker. She was the character I was least excited for in this box, but I was the most curious about her because in the movie, at least, that mech suit she's got, that's a big suit. That's big. That's a huge robot. So I was like, is this going to be an oversized mini? What are we looking at here? What's happening with this miniature? The answer is it's a little bit bigger but not by much. Uh, let me scroll down to the mini first so we can see it. That's it there. And it's hard to tell from this image, but if you look at the back of the box, it looks like this mech suit is the size of a normal miniature. And then you just have this little girl sitting on top of it. So it's like 
it's not oversized, but it's just a little wee bit bigger. It's one and a third the size of a normal mini. As far as I can tell, I could be dead wrong, but it looks like that's the case, which is perfect. I, that's a great way to handle the Penny Parker suit. Um, and then here we have these beautiful cards again with the dark purple and the red and the yellow. They just go so well together. They nailed it. And she's got these great cards like Robot Strength, Webs, and all these things with uh, battery. You may use a battery because she has a battery equipment card. And this activates additional special effects on the cards. So you can just do them for their basic effects, or you can spend a battery to use things like Safety Net, which rescues one civilian in your location, and then use the battery to rescue an additional one in your or an adjacent location. Beautiful. Um, and then you can use the battery here in Robot Strength to deal an extra damage. I mean, it's, it's just a great way to give yourself a little boost, and it fits the theme of Penny Parker so well. So I love that. Very much. Her stuff is very impressive all around. It just looks gorgeous. Spider Punk. Again, the mini of the box, maybe. Talk about a box full of good minis. This might be the one. I don't know. But Spider Punk, they, they really uh, embrace the heart of his punkness. His cards are beautiful. That acid yellowy green, which spells punk to me when it's mixed with that hot neon pink. Everything's firing on all cylinders. These are great cards. So according to what they say here, uh, this, this, I remember this being a little complicated. Let me see if I can figure it out again. Hobie doesn't play by anybody's rules but his own. Always ready to fight the power, he can move to any location to attack a henchman or villain. The more civilians are put in danger, the more violent spider punk gets. This is great. Dealing out vicious attacks with his angry heart equal to the number of endangered civilians in his location. So you go to a location that's like, you go to like Central Park, for example, with five civilians on it, he can do five punches. Um, I'm just trying to think if there is a villain who covers the board and a lot of civilians. Thanos. Thanos starts off with a lot of civilians. So if you want to take out Thanos' uh, henchmen really quickly, Spider Punk might be the man for the job here. Uh, he can even rally the masses into an anarchic uprising using civilians in several locations to attack his enemies. Right, I think that's this one, Anarchy in Earth 1-1. Uh, one, one. Um, punch in up to three locations with any civilians, then discard one civilian in each of those locations. So yeah, he's inciting the mob. And when all else fails, he may just stun the enemy with 15,000 watts of punk rock to form an army of amps set to 11. Um, but the yeah, search and destroy that lets him move anywhere. So he's really aggressive and having civilians really pumps him up. That's awesome. And he gets web shooters that do the same thing as Scarlet Spider's web shooters. And there's that many with the spikes jumping over the amp holding the guitar. Painters are going to have a blast with this one. I wish I was talented enough to be a painter um, or have the funds to buy paints because I spent all my money on Marvel United. But damn, is that ever great. That is a great characters. So that's it for the heroes. Now we move into the anti-heroes. And like most people suspected, Anti-Venom is one of them. So here he is. See, I didn't know this because I don't read the modern comics, but apparently it's Eddie Brock. Okay, so Eddie Brock is in that suit. So technically it's a reskin of Venom, but I'll let it slide. I'll let it slide. I don't care. I don't care. I'm having too much fun. As a hero, Anti-Venom can cleanse the body of any hero, ridding them of any crisis tokens a villain may have burdened them with. <laughs> That I can think of like four different villains just off the top of my head that that's useful for. His anti-venom serum can be used to rescue civilians or defeat thugs containing any symbiote infection. He can also generate his own weapon, ensuring he can always get a free move whenever he is not available. So he's he seems pretty powerful, and he seems like a scary villain too. But body cleansing, draw one card, then hero in your location may discard all of their crisis tokens. Like is and you get to draw a card like. Seriously, rescue up to two civilians or defeat up to two thugs in your location. That's great. And then this webbing generation, as long as this card is face up in the storyline, if there are, uh, I can't see what that says there, but if there are something at the bottom of the last two cards in the storyline, you may perform one free move. Um, okay, so if, I think if there are no moves on the last two cards. So he will get a move regardless, which is pretty cool. And that's a wild thing. So if that is a starting hand card, and I think it is. Talk about a great starting hand card. I tend to run out of moves more than anything else. 
I was just playing not too long ago and I had Gamora and Nebula and Cyclops. And Gamora and Nebula had like five cards each left to go and none of them had moves. So I was up a creek. I was like, what am I going to do? I can't win this fight. So having anti-venom in a situation like that would be pretty groovy. But then as a villain, he uses his ability to deprive the heroes of their powers. His BAM causes overflows and the heroes are forced to discard uh, and sorry, with his BAM doesn't cause overflows. I'm reading this wrong. By using his BAM and causing overflows, the heroes are forced to discard from their hand cards with special effects. And if they can't, they take damage and must turn face down a card with special effects on the storyline if they have any. That's brutal. That is brutal. Um, so you're essentially neutering the heroes like that. Uh, kind of like what Mr. Sinister did, but it looks like anti Venom can do that from the start. And his threats camouflage him. They cleanse his body so he can't get tokens. He's going to be tough. Um, every core box has had a villain, I think, that they suggest you face off against first, like Red Skull in the first one, and they're saying Cosmic Ghost Rider for Multiverse. I'm curious who it is here. I have a feeling it's going to be Spot because he sounds like he's the easiest. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be Anti Venom, though, because he sounds really hard. Uh, but there's his piece, and he's purple. Um, and he's got the tendrils coming off him. I love it. Superior Spider-Man is next, and this guy is really thematic. Andrea told us about him back in the day, um, back during the campaign. He's got the black and red cards because he's got a black and red suit. I love it. Um, he's got a genius intellect, and he's going to be dropping spider bots all over the, the map. Uh, he can use them as decoys, discarding them to avoid damage, or he can have them perform attack or heroic actions wherever they are. So the spider bots give him a lot of reach which makes him a really versatile hero. So he doesn't even need a lot of move cards. Um, but you have to just, you have to, I don't know if you have to discard them once they've been used. But then he has that very thematic card that has to go at the bottom of the deck, final understanding. And once it's in your hand, you have to play it. So once he reaches his final card, he has to die, essentially, because that's what happens here. Final understanding, if this card is in your hand, you must play it at the end of this turn. You are KO'd. You may remove... Superior Spider-Man from the game. If you do, on your next hero turn, choose another Spider-Man hero and enter play in any location. Very thematic. I heard about what happens with Dr. Octopus becoming Superior Spider-Man and dying and all that. Spoilers, I guess. Um, so they really went all out with that. And I got to respect them for that because it's not too often. I think the only other one where they said they really felt like they hit the story on the head was Old Man Logan. So this feels like it's going in that direction and it's really embracing the complexity of the heroes that we've gotten in seasons two and three. Because uh, season one heroes were pretty basic for the most part. So it's nice to have heroes like this. Uh, man, those spider bots, those are going to be handy. And then his mechanical arms, uh, he's got these two equipment cards. The arms grant him additional attack or heroic actions while his web shooters help him to pull guns and civilians just like the other web shooters. But then as a villain, he's out to prove he can be a better Spider-Man. So as a villain, Superior Spider-Man has his own set of mission cards. And he's sending out the Spider-Bots. So he is not only fighting the heroes, but he's using the arms on the bots to rescue civilians and defeat thugs. So he's trying to prove he's better, which is such a Dr. Octopus thing to do. Be like, I'm smarter than you. Uh, again, I, the cartoons, man, he had a Bavarian accent. Don't judge me. Uh, any overflowing tokens also go on his mission. So if he completes overflow, he completes his mission cards. And if he ever completes two of his missions, Superior Spider-Man wins. He is the villain I was most intrigued by because back during the uh, campaign, Andrea said, I can't wait for people to play against Superior Spider-Man as a villain. First of all, that made me excited because I was like, ooh, that means... He's an anti-hero because we hadn't had that confirmed yet. But second of all, it just got me excited to see what he can do. And now that I can see it, I can see why Andrea would have been stoked for us to try this. Um, so heroes can take out the spider bots, though they are also replenished by some of his threats and master playing cards. And sometimes they'll even attack the heroes because other threats may neutralize hero special effects or accelerate the master plan, while his unstable behavior makes superior Spider-Man untouchable until they are cleared. Cool. He seems like a, a well-rounded guy, even though he's very different. Um, and he's standing on a chimney. Look at that gorgeous miniature. 
that is, in my opinion, that's 10 times cooler than the Iron Spider. It just, come on, look at it. That's wonderful. And then we move into the villains with Morlin, who is probably going to be the hardest one, I would assume. He consumes the life force of the heroes. Through his master plan cards, he can sense their life force, tagging them with crisis tokens. A fierce hunter, he can then deal unpreventable damage, ouch, to heroes with crisis tokens. And when a hero is KO'd, Morlin might simply absorb their life force, gaining extra health. Ouch. A KO'd hero is outright removed from the game, being replaced by a new one. Ouch. Oh, that's always annoying when that happens. Uh, once enough heroes are eliminated, it's game over. So he goes by Thanos rules, more or less. Morlin is aided by a powerful cabal of henchmen who also absorb the life force of heroes KO'd in their location, gaining extra health. Yeah, he's going to be the hardest one in this box. Um, these are all his henchmen here. We have, uh, I'm assuming this is who these people are, Deimos, Genix, Verna, Brix, Bora, and Karn. They give me real Hellfire Club vibes, uh, and they all do different things here. It says Deimos will wail on the hero or wipe out all the civilians. He looks like the biggest, most brutish one. Genix is going to inject heroes with crisis tokens. Verna's power can damage a hero anywhere in the game. Jeez. Brix and Bora work in tandem to corner the heroes, with Bora being able to absorb some damage. And finally, Karn, this guy, actually moves around like, I guess, Toad, hunting the heroes with deadly attacks. I'm not looking forward to fighting Morlin. I'm just put, stating that for the record. And there is his miniature. He's standing on... What's he standing on? It looks like the roof of a house that has caught fire. Neat. He's, ooh, he's scary, man. Um, first time I ever heard of Morlin was in, I had like this old DK um, hardcover illustrated guide to Spider-Man. And when I saw that, uh, I turned the page and I saw him and I saw the way he looked, you know, and he looks like this. And he had the pale skin and I thought, is this guy a vampire? Is this just like a poor man's Morbius? And for the longest time, I thought that's what he was until this Kickstarter campaign came out and I was intrigued and I looked him up and now he's this thing called an inheritor. Um, he's vampiric, but he's not a vampire. Um, but you can have Morbius fight Morlin now in this game. So maybe I should do that just to, uh, to cleanse that old way of thinking from my mind. But damn, he looks hard and these civilians look hard. Uh, civilians, henchmen is what they're called, Andrew. Uh, can you tell it's been a long day for me? But yeah, they all look very hard. And that's Moreland. And then finally, Jonathan Ohm, the Spot, the villain of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Spot may look funky, but he's no mere villain of the week, placing Spot portal tokens on all locations. He is a very slippery opponent with all his master plan cards teleporting him around. That's so cool. He starts with a number of crisis tokens, which he discards whenever he takes damage immediately slipping away to the next portal before a hero can land more than one punch on him. Wow. On the other hand, while his attacks may not be devastating, he's very hard to evade. Half his threats make his attacks from the spotted dimension unpreventable, and if he finds himself with no targets around him, he may punch a faraway hero right through a portal. Perfect. That's how spot works. He accelerates his plan by KOing heroes, something that is facilitated by overflows that damage heroes there. And even if there are no heroes in the overflow location, the other half of this threat ensures a hero somewhere is always damaged by overthrow. So he's covering a lot of bases. And his miniature is really neat because it looks like it's got some dimensional texture to it. If you look at right here, uh, his face, that looks like an indentation, like you could fit your thumb in that spot. And all of his spots look like that. So they almost kind of gave him a Swiss cheese kind of thing. Um, on an unpainted mini, I can understand how it would be difficult to convey a guy who looks like this. So I think that they hit the nail on the head with that, particularly that indentation in his face. He looks like a Zelda villain. If anybody's been playing Tears of the Kingdom right now, he looks like Master Koga, like he's part of the um, um, Yiga clan. So it, it fits, it, it makes him look sinister. Uh, and I don't know what he's throwing out of his hands, but I like that too. I like this mini. This is a perfect spot mini. I still would probably say my favorite mini. Yeah, my favorite mini's got to be Spider Punk. 
I'm sorry. There's so many good ones in here. Um, there's not a bad one in the bunch, but Spider Punk is is far and away going to take the the uh, the best mini of the box for me. Um, if I had to judge a little bit more here, I would say my favorite hero cards, just the way they look and everything. Scarlet Spider, hands down. Uh, favorite abilities, Symbiote Spider-Man, because that uh, losing control, perfect. Like you could not have made that better for Symbiote Spider-Man. Um, the, is that all the heroes? My favorite hero in general, Scarlet Spider. I'm just too excited to try him out. In terms of the villains, uh, the, I mean, you, you have to give props to Superior Spider-Man for how different he is. So I think I got to go for that. Superior Spider-Man is um, taking my award for the most interesting villain of the box, the one I'm most excited to try. The one I'm least excited to try is Moreland, just because he sounds like he's going to demolish me. Uh, but I'm still going to try him all eventually once my randomizer lets me pick them. Remember, I play randomly. So there's still villains to this day I have not faced from seasons. I still not faced Black Dwarf or Bob, the Hydra agent, or um, Ronin. I still haven't faced Ronin because his name just hasn't come up when I randomly select the villain. Uh, last but not least, we have locations. And these are cool. These are, first of all, they look great. There's eight of them because that's how many you get in the core box. And it really covers a lot of ground. So we have the Great Weaver Temple, which rewards sacrifice with attack and heroic tokens. The Parker Residence here is a good place to rest and recover. That's all they say about it. We can't see the thing there, but I'm sure it's a place that'll let you draw a card. Horizon Labs uses your equipment to recharge any other equipment in the game. That's cool. It's a neat trade-off. Good. Uh, you can strategize with your friends with that one. In Las Vegas, this is fun. In Las Vegas, you can vex whether the next master plan card will add more thugs or more civilians, winning a wild token and some useful information if you're lucky. Isn't that cool? That is such a cool location. As far as the useful information, I'm going to guess it'll let you look at the next master plan card. Maybe. I can't imagine what else it would let you do. Or, or just look at the bottom one? I don't know. I feel like the most useful information any hero would want is like the Black Widow power. Like, let me look at that card. Um, you just probably wouldn't be able to bet on it next time because you already know what it does. Um, players may add a couple of thugs in Japan to gain an action token of their choice. Very cool. Loom World can take you to any location. Okay, so that's kind of like a like the helicarrier that can fly you around. Spider Island is a deadly place with thugs that will damage you if you ever end your turn there. Okay, so you just can't end your turn there while they're thugs or you're gonna get hurt. And then Sims Tower is not a skyscraper where it's just a bunch of people playing the game The Sims 24 seven, even though that would be fantastic and I would pay money to watch it happen. No, Sims Tower has a supply of heroic tokens that the heroes may draw from or replenish with the added benefit that they can be used to ignore damage there. So it's a little bit, it's one of those more complex locations, but it's got kind of a take a penny, leave a penny thing going on, if in this case, pennies were heroic tokens. So it starts with two of them, and heroes may discard any number of them from here to ignore the same amount of damage, and you can either take one or leave one. Cool. Eight more amazing, colorful, beautifully illustrated locations to add to the ever-growing stack of them. Uh, Las Vegas is a cool one. It's one I didn't know I wanted. Same with Japan, but now I want them. And that's it. Then we get the look at the box again, and there we have it. What's next in the master plan? If, if we only knew. And that, as they say, is that. So that is the news that has uh, come out, all the details about Spider Geddon, Marvel United Spider Geddon, and I can't wait. I mean, I was excited in January. I've been drooling for information, as we all have, and now we finally got it. And October is only two and a half months away. So we are two and a half months away from getting this. And the beauty of it is, 
it's coming at a nice time because let's say, let's use the middle of the month. Let's say October 15th is when we get our hands on spider debt. That means, let's do some quick math, November, December, January, February, March. When we get our hands on it, we have five months with it before season three arrives on our doorstep. Not bad, right? Not too bad. Uh, five months to, you know, tides us over for a bit, just like we like to do here, tiding you over, making the weights a little easier with these videos. So that'll do it for me for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me as we looked at Spider Geddon. Let me know in the comments, what has you excited? What are your favorite minis? What are your favorite looking cards? Uh, and which hero excites you the most? Which villain excites you the most? I want to know it all. I want to know what people are feeling. Check the Spider Geddon temperature. Until next time, everybody, please may you all be the masters of your own universe, or should I say, Spider-Verse. Hey-oh!